Are we ready? Yeah, are we feeling good? Are we feeling excited about mobilizing communities to enable a sustainable and equi equitable future for all? Yes, we are! Woo! So it is my absolute great pleasure to invite Kate Brandt to come and to moderate this fantastic session with an incredible set of community organizers. And I can see them standing over there. Come on up! Woo! 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 Kate! 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 Come on up. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's have you up here. Perhaps we could have Kate over here. Maybe you would come and join us here. You could come and sit down here. Maybe we could have Kate. And um, you want me here? No. We're going to have Administrator oh, Reagan there, so maybe you might want to sit here. Okay. And maybe, should, should we invite Michael and Pedro and, and um, uh, Administrator Reagan as well? Woo, woo. Administrator Reagan, it's so great to see you. Good to see you, yes. Thank you. Come and sit down, Peggy. Do you want to come and sit here? Thank you very much. Right, We're the panel's first. all ready, so I can get off stage. <laughs> the comfy seats. Great. Well, welcome everyone. We are thrilled to be here at Solutions House, and we know that we have people online, so thank you for joining us as well. Today, we're going to talk about mobilizing communities for a sustainable and equitable future. So why is it important, and how can we actually make it a reality? My name is Paulina Ponce de Leon. I am a partner with the Boston Consulting Group, and I spend my time helping companies and NGOs advance their sustainability agendas. As you can see, we have an amazing group of people here today. We have Michael Reagan, Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, Kate Brand, Chief Sustainability Officer of Google, Michael Smith, CEO of AmeriCorps, and Pedro Luz, the creator of Ciencia Todo Dia, which is um, the largest science YouTube channel in Brazil. So great group of people, and we have a great audience. And maybe you can help us get a pulse check of who we have here today. How many of you are students or young professionals? Ooh, we need more, <laughs> we need more young people getting involved in these. OK, we have one. How many of you are activists and community organizers? Great. How many of you work with the private sector? OK, very good. This is going to be a great conversation. Yes. Let's dive in. Um, Administrator, we'll start with you. So from your perspective, what does a sustainable and equitable future look like? And what's the work that we need to do to get there? Well, thank you for the question, and, and thank you for having us. You know, it's my belief that uh, we have a significant opportunity to have just a beautiful transition into a clean energy economy, a multi-trillion dollar clean energy economy uh, where everyone can participate. And I think that what we've attempted to do through public-private partnerships and historic legislation is to be sure that we build capacity in our communities so that everyone can participate in the transition. I was chatting with some of my friends in California who were self-proclaimed AI geeks who <laughs> really were just talking about what if we, through artificial intelligence and technology, could just rule out bias and really focus on solutions. Well, it really is about eliminating bias and not being paternalistic and taking these historic resources and saying, let's match these dollars with the very communities who have been disproportionately impacted, but also who have had solutions for decades. And so I'm just really excited that there are enough like-minded people who are thinking about how we tackle this, these environmental injustices and this system full of biases and beginning to arm our communities with capacity to participate, again, in a multi-trillion dollar clean energy economy that can work for everyone. Michael, what, what's your take on this? What does it take to create a sustainable future? So, so when I think about a sustainable future, I, I think about uh, Vice President Harris has been talking a lot about uh, freedom lately. Uh, and when she talks about the climate, she talks about uh, we need to have a, a future of freedom, freedom to breathe clean air, uh, freedom to drink clean water, um, freedom to play and enjoy in spaces, freedom uh, to know that you can grow up and not worried if you're going to have a planet to inherit. And so when I think about what is this green future, it's, it's not necessarily about the planet, it's about the people um, and making sure that all of our children are going to grow up in a space where there is nothing that stands away uh, between them 
and, and their biggest dreams. And I'm just really excited that AmeriCorps uh, can be a part of the solution with EPA and our partners. Um, AmeriCorps is the federal agency for volunteering and service. For 31 years uh, this week, uh, we have been providing opportunities for folks that want to give long-term sustainable service to their communities to not only make a difference in the communities on education, on climate, um, on food insecurity, on hunger, on homelessness, um, not only to make a different on, difference on those issues, but by doing so also transforming their own lives. Mm -hmm. And so with the American Climate Corps, which Administrator Regan and I have launched with five other federal agencies, HUD just came on board, yes. um, we are providing a new opportunity to turn climate anxiety into climate action so young people can actually be a part of building that future, future of freedom. Mm. That is really exciting. Um, Kate, I'm sure you see these every day. From the Google perspective, what, um, what does a clean energy future look like? And what are some of the challenges that we need to overcome? Yeah, no, it's such a pleasure to be with you both and really to build on these excellent points that you're making. We see such an opportunity at Google as an information and an innovation company to put data and technology in the hands of communities, of partners, of individuals to enable them to build a more sustainable future. So that's really our vision, that our technology can be that underpinning and also to be really focused on solutions. I'm so happy that you mentioned that. You know, what we see consistently through research is that people feel more hopeful when you're putting solutions in their hands, when you're talking to them not only about the challenge, but about what can we do about it. So that's really been the orientation of how we think about the role that our technology can play. And then also, we operate a global business. We want to be very responsible in the energy that we use and how we train our AI models. This is a topic that there's been a lot of appropriate focus on recently. And so that also comes back to the community. How do we partner with the community to bring more carbon-free energy online? And that's something that we've done a lot of listening around, of talking with our communities around what do they need, how do we bring greater access to clean energy to everyone, and how do we use our demand to enable that. And so one pilot that we did recently was with a company called EDP North America, where they did 500 megawatts of community solar in the PJM territory, and also were able to give energy bill credits to members of that community to further alleviate energy burden. So I think it's those kind of creative solutions, both enabling through data and also using our demand signals as companies where we can really partner with communities. Mm -hmm. Th those are really a great examples of how we're bringing people together. And we always talk about the importance of bringing more young people in, diverse communities, sometimes disenfranchised communities. Um, Administrator Reagan, I'm going to come back to you. What are some of the ways in which you're bringing younger generations uh, into the topic, getting them activated into environmental justice and, and this climate action movement that we need? Yes, I think that um, <clears throat> when I think about every major social movement, not just in the United States, but around the world, uh, they've all been led by young people. And I believe that it's our obligation to give young people a platform and a voice, not in a transactional manner, but more so listening and looking to young people to innovate and help us dream and be optimistic and imagine what the future should look like for them and for our children and our grandchildren. And so at EPA, from day one, we've been engaging young people um, on the topic of climate change and uh, chemicals and plastics. And we were just mining them for so much good information that we decided to formalize the relationship and created a national youth uh, environmental Advisory Committee, uh, a formal FACA where we in public have this great exchange with individuals from 16 to 29 on the policies and regulations that we're charged with. And EPA is better off for it. Uh, the country is better off for it. And so I think we have to continue to provide the platform. Uh, we have to continue to listen. And I I've learned so much, even in terms of just the talking points that I use. I used to constantly use the phrase climate crisis. And then a bunch of young people talked to me about that introduces anxiety. Mm. When someone in a powerful position talks about a crisis without a solution, that's automatic anxiety. So let's think about how we choose our words carefully 
invite robust discussion, but also be solutions oriented, whether it's through service or data, public private partnerships. And so we should be uh, selling optimism, right, through solution. And I think the only way to effectively do that is to surround ourselves with very young, innovative entrepreneurial thinkers. And I think we've tried to do that at EPA. That's great. Um, I think you have a big announcement today. Uh, <laughs> would you like to share a little bit more about how, you, how you're bringing together this environmental justice um, community? We'll let Michael number you're one go. <laughs> <laughs> and then Michael not in this room, not in this room, <laughs> only at AmeriCorps. Uh, <laughs> there's actually another Michael Smith at AmeriCorps now. Oh, really? I think I, I'm going to have to find him another job. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, so I'm excited. Uh, we, this has been a long time coming, and there are lots of folks in this room that have been working on the creation of Engi Environmental Justice uh, Climate Corps, uh, which is going to be a part of President Biden's American Climate Corps, and we are excited to announce that today. Uh, it's going to deploy hundreds of young people to communities across the country uh, to work on the issue of centering environmental justice in this American Climate Corps movement. And what I'm excited about is it's going to give people an opportunity um, to not, you know, we've got a lot of American Climate Corps members that are working on the front lines, that are doing fire mitigation, that are getting their hands dirty, doing a trail removal, doing sol solar panels. And this is going to be a partnership with our AmeriCorps VISTA program, which is about building uh, capacity uh, in organizations that are focused on justice and alleviating poverty. And so these uh, EJCC members are actually going to go in and think about resource navigation, think about job training, thinking about what are the strategies uh, to reduce pollution and address some of the the challenges uh, that communities that are closest to the pain are experiencing. Uh, and so this is the, one of the largest partnerships in the history of AmeriCorps working with another federal agency. And I'm also really proud that we've done this in record time. I think uh, yes. we were with uh, President Biden uh, not even a year ago uh, in, in talking about this. Uh, and here we are today ready to announce this commitment. And we are going to have uh, hundreds of, of new AmeriCorps members that are going to be tackling this issue uh, in in the weeks to come. Well, and, and, yes. <laughs> and I, I'm just so excited uh, about this announcement. I mean, Michael has done such an amazing job just revolutionizing AmeriCorps and really bringing it into the 21st century and reintroducing this concept in a way that I think America is digesting it properly. And I, I think the president has sung his praises. And so for us at EPA, which by the way, at EPA, we have uh, a lot of Peace Corps veterans. Like the mm -hmm. service component of EPA is there. I think this is our first partnership with AmeriCorps and our first opportunity to invest in a domestic public service uh, interagency opportunity. And so just to be able to provide $25 million as a start, uh, we're hoping to engage more than 250 EJ AmeriCorps members in their communities. The exciting thing about this is uh, we have finally let go of this paternalism. Mm. And we are admitting we don't have all of the solutions. And to be able to meet young people in their communities, mm -hmm. have them decide and define the solutions and engage us is so refreshing. And so I just thank Michael for opening the platform so that we could partner on this effort. And we're going to then hire a lot of these guys. <laughs> uh, EPA, you're also one of the highest employers of AmeriCorps alum as well. And so one of the great things about uh, this new program, American Climate Corps in, in, in general, is not only are we going to have them today, but we're going to have them for their and beyond. Yes. We're giving them the skills that they need, the training, the credentialing, uh, so that they will stay in the good paying jobs uh, in the federal government and also with our community partners across the country. You've been visiting some of the communities and the work that folks are doing. Can you tell us a story, like one of the stories of the impact that you've seen? Oh my goodness, There's, there are so many stories. I'm blown away every day uh, by folks that, that choose to get uncomfortable. Um, you know, the economy's great, thanks Joe Biden. Uh, and so, <laughs> so, you know, folks can, are getting a lot of competition. They can go work for Google. They can, they can go work for BCG. And so I'm just so moved by often young people who are saying, I'm going to be uncomfortable. I'm going to 
sacrifice a little because I care about this issue. And so if I had to think about a story today, it, it would be right here in New York, because I was just with uh, one of our AmeriCorps alum yesterday, a young man by the name of Domingo Morales. Uh, and Domingo was a part of Green City Force, which is an AmeriCorps program that's headquartered in the Bronx. Uh, and it's one of those programs that you don't think about often when you think about climate, because it's in the Bronx. Uh, but they are doing community gardening. They are doing uh, feeding the people in New York City public housing. Uh, they are thinking about uh, heat uh, uh, islands within, within the city. They are doing solar. And so Domingo says that he was walking through his public housing uh, one day. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do with his life. He thought he had a few tattoos that would be disqualifying for certain jobs. Uh, and uh, he found a flyer for Green City Force. And he's like, I don't really like dirt, uh, but I don't, I don't know what else to do. And he fell in love with dirt. And let me tell you, this kid geeks out about dirt. He talks about the FBI, about fungus, bacteria, and I don't know what the third, what the eye is. Uh, and so he fell in love with this and fell in love with understanding what the challenges were that were facing his community, how it was once again communities of color that were feeling disproportionately the impacts of the climate crisis. I'm gonna change that in my language. Uh, and, and so he became an all-star uh, Green City Force member. Uh, and then he didn't want to stop. So he created his own business uh, called Compost Power, which now works with nonprofits and cities and the bureau boroughs across New York uh, to do composting across New York City. And you know who his first hires were? AmeriCorps alum. Uh, and so that's, that's what I think about. I think about how it changed his life. I think about how it's changing uh, the community and how it's making a, a difference uh, for so many uh, much further beyond their year of service. Pedro, I'm going to turn to you. You have activated a lot of people as well, and you've brought science to millions. So what are, um, what are some of the things that we need to do to get more people excited about science, about the technical solutions that are out there, and really engaged in the communities? I think we creators are in a very special spot that we can easily communicate with people in the sense that for the like many, many decades ago, there was this rift, this loss of trust that people did not, like they, they stopped trusting official, like uh, the government or companies and stuff like that. And so sending normal people in their day-to-day -day lives, this climate message got really hard from like some time ago to now. And I think creators are in a very privileged position because I mean, we are called influencers for a reason. And we can like get to people and they listen to us because after all, people connect to people. But what has been happening like for many, many years ago, and it's starting to change now and that makes me happy, is that we were being left out of the conversation. Mm. And how can we influence people and even like accept the message ourselves if we are like being kept away from the conversation. So for the past week, I've been here, I've been to, uh, for two days at uh, UNGA, and it was like opportunity of offered to me by YouTube. And stuff like this is really important. It really matters for our world because I was already someone worried about the climate. I make like I have a science channel, so that's something I think <laughs> a, a natural like it's just natural. But after this whole week we here, I I, I want to become an activist. Mm. I want to go back to Brazil, and I'm doing so tomorrow. And I want to like just start engaging in groups and doing my part and trying to influence more people for change, for understanding the message and being a part of what they want to be, of the future they want to be. Mm -hmm. But for that, we, we also need to be a part of mm -hmm. this. Like the conversation also has to happen with us and we need to feel like we are like understanding exactly why decisions are being made, why something is being made this way and not another way or, some, or something like that. And so I think that's our start. That's great. Mm. We've that is. So we're talking about creating bridges to solve the solutions and continue to make progress. Kate, um, all of these will require a multilateral cross-sector approach. So what's the role that Google can play as yeah. a company and also just bringing 
everyone together. Yeah. Well, congratulations on this announcement. This is just absolutely tremendous and so inspiring. And to have you know leaders like both of you who are putting the power of public service in the hands of so many communities. It's just so exciting. So really, congratulations. And also, I love the conversation we're having, right, and how you're saying we can use the power of platforms like YouTube, of YouTube creators, to be yet another powerful messenger to come from communities to highlight the messages, to highlight the challenges and the opportunities. So I'm, I'm so happy we're having this conversation. And I'll add in another dimension, which is sort of back to what I was saying around data, using data to further empower our communities. Um, you know, Administrator Regan, you and I have sat on the Solutions House stage before with some of the major leading lights of the environmental justice movement have been doing this work for you know, more than a half century, folks like Dr. Bullard and Dr. Wright and many others. And so um, we took the opportunity to really speak with these leading lights of the movement to say, what do you need? What's going to enable you to empower the next generation of environmental justice leaders, which is what we heard from them was so important to them. And what they said was, we need more data, you know, even as researchers having digital tools that can further unlock data about toxicity, about air quality, about water quality, that's where we need more help. Um, and so we um, teamed up with some of these leaders and built something called the Environmental Justice Data Fund. And so this is through Google.org, our foundation. And this is a fund um, that's now awarded $13 million in grants um, to organizations across the US to really focus on unlocking the power of data to drive more environmental justice outcomes. And so this has been, I think, a really powerful program. It, we've had a huge reception. Over 450 people and organizations have applied. We've now been able to give grants to 90 different organizations. And we built this really incredible advisory board to really guide this work so that the communities were guiding us where should we be putting these resources. And they said, we really need them in the South. So more than half of the resources have gone to communities across the Southwest and the Southeast and the South Atlantic to really empower them with data and also with Google Fellows to support the unlocking of that work. So that's been a really powerful opportunity we've seen. <clears throat> and then if we also look you know, halfway around the world, we've been also thinking about what does it look like to enable a just transition in Africa, especially in communities where there isn't a lot of access to energy um, or where there's major load shedding events that are really interrupting communities and their livelihood. Uh, and so we teamed up with C40 and in this case, looking at, you know, we have this goal to operate on 24 by 7 carbon free energy, but what would that look like for a city in South Africa like Etiquini? And so we did this really amazing pilot with Etiquini where, you know, they're impacted by these load shedding events every day. 63% of their population lives beneath the poverty line. And what we found is if we can support these communities in access to carbon free energy, wind and solar and storage and other solutions, it can have a huge uplift in terms of GDP, it can lower the levelized cost of energy, and it can create local jobs. And so some of the insights that came out of this pilot are now being adopted by the city council and are really hopefully going to become a model for other light communities. So those are two examples that I want to share, both around data supporting communities here in the US, but also how do we bring these models like 24 by carbon free energy to communities um, that are also building out a new and just energy future. Mm. They're, they're great examples. It's the power and the magic of Google that is really enabling a lot of this stuff. You guys are activating the power of young people and, and communities to do this, and you want to be an activist, and you're influencing a bunch of people. Let's talk about being activists. All of you, I am sure, have engaged with people that are uh, ident that identify as activists and I, that I would describe as maybe good troublemakers. Mm. So what makes from each of your perspectives and the roles that you play, what makes someone an effective activist? And maybe tell us a story about someone who, that has shaped how you approach your job or how you go about doing, delivering on the responsibilities of your organization. Hmm. Administrator Reagan, we can start with you. Yeah, I think from my perspective, what makes an effective activist um, is what Pedro is offering up, which is not only do I want to be a part, uh, I'm willing to take on some accountability mm. for joint solutions. There are a lot of people who want to throw rocks from the outside, yeah. and I don't necessarily consider that effective activism. Um, an, an effective advocate or activist 
basically says, these are really big problems, but they're not insurmountable. So I'm willing to step in the ring with you and iron sharpens iron, and we're gonna work together and come up with the best solutions possible. Mm -hmm. And they won't be perfect solutions, and we'll have to go back and you'll have to sell it to your stakeholder, I have to sell it to my stakeholder, but it will advance society. Mm -hmm. And I think um, some effect effective advocates are two that Kate mentioned, uh, Dr. Beverly Wright and Dr. Robert Bullard. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, they have been in the game for a long time. And one of the most rewarding experiences that I've had is knowing these individuals for a long period of time, watching their advocacy over 25 or 30 years, and then as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, being able to give Dr. Bullard $50 million to steer grants into communities, giving Dr. Wright $10 million to begin to break down and provide technical assistance to other communities, we're now starting to see the full circle of the accountable, responsible advocate. They have positioned themselves to get these resources that we're offering, whether it be through government grants or through data and transparency. I think that that is what's gonna propel us into the future. You're here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh my goodness, when I think about activists, there would be no AmeriCorps uh, without activists, yeah. right? Uh, this was a big, bold vision that we should use your hard-earned uh, federal taxpayer dollars uh, to enable folks that wanted to give dedicated service to their country. There were some people that wanted it, some people that didn't want it. And 31 years ago, the, some of the biggest voices that wanted it, uh, they didn't call themselves the climate movement at the time, I think they called themselves the conservation movement. They fought, they showed up, they talked to members of Congress and they said, we need this and we're here 31 years later. And by the way, every generation, every 10 years, every five years, it's been other activists who, who are moving. And when I think about activists, I think one, you know, you think about people at the, the head of a line that are yelling and marching and picketing, uh, but I think the first trait of an activist is the willing to be quiet, willingness to be quiet, the willingness to step back and to learn, the willingness to embed yourself in the community, even if you are a part of that community, to learn about the people that went before you, learn the lessons that were, were learned, the, the failures that happened so you don't have to repeat them. Um, some Sometimes it's about using your capital and your privilege um, and being quiet from behind and pushing a movement, and so that's an effective activist. I think sometimes it's making people uncomfortable and setting a radical vision that is so radical that even if you don't get there, you get here and things are better. Um, I remember I worked in the Obama White House um, and a good friend of mine ran a big online civil rights organization, and there were times where I felt like I was an internal White House uh, <laughs> activist having <laughs> strong conversations with our lawyers uh, and, and, and our comms folks who maybe had different visions of things than I did. Uh, and my friend who was on the outside was literally delivering petitions. Uh, and we both saw ourselves as having a role to play in, in moving things forward. And so I'm grateful for these folks uh, and you that are sometimes inside of institutions and doing that good trouble um, from, from, from the inside as well. And, and the last thing I would say, I'm just really excited about what AmeriCorps does to spark that internal activism in people. AmeriCorps members take a pledge, and the last line of, of the pledge is, I will take this commitment with me this year and beyond. Mm. And what I'm excited about is the and beyond, the 1.3 million AmeriCorps alum uh, who have taken this year of service and turned it into a lifetime commitment of social action. I think about people like Brittany Packnett, um, who was a Teach for America AmeriCorps member, who is now, you know, was on the, the lead of the Ferguson movement and continues to be an activist. I think of Alicia Garza, who was an AmeriCorps member in Oakland and is one of the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. I think about Damon Hewitt, uh, who was a founding AmeriCorps member in Treasure Island in San Francisco and is now the CEO of the Lawyers Committee uh, for, for Civil Rights. And so I'm excited about this passion that comes with service that gets stirred up where you just can't leave it behind. And when I think about the fact that we now have 15,000 AmeriCorps American Climate Corps members in less than a year. What this is gonna do to change the game for climate justice in this country, I can't wait to see what happens. Amazing. You're building a movement. Yes. <laughs> Which is fantastic. Totally. Kate. Yes. Um, well, in addition to the very inspirational leaders from the environmental justice movement that we've already um, talked about, I would also note the youth climate movement. Um, folks like Greta Thunberg and Fridays for Future, the Sunrise Movement, and many others 
I have seen firsthand the power that the youth climate movement has had, especially in boardrooms. Um, I really, I often think about, now going back several years ago, I would have this experience almost weekly for a little while where I would have executives from our company, from other companies, policymakers I knew that were not in the climate world coming to me and saying, hey, Kate, I've not really been paying attention, but my son, my daughter, this girl that I coach in softball, they're coming and talking to me about climate change. And like, I think I need to do something about this. Like, what should I do? And, and it was really, really powerful to see how that particular moment in the youth climate movement really woke up so many adults who had kids in their lives who were not paying attention. And now I think we're seeing, you know, this huge opportunity that creators, we've been talking about this, the power of YouTube creators like you, Pedro, and of Alice Edie in the house, who's an incredible climate creator, and so many others of taking that energy and then focusing it on solutions, right? We're on the solutions house stage. It's all about talking about what are those solutions? How do you make them tangible? What's working? Also, what's not working and how do we make it better? What policies do we need? What community actions can we take? What can we do in our daily lives? So I've been really inspired to see the power of the youth climate movement and also how it's evolving and where we can go and the real power that we have on platforms like YouTube to really be a megaphone for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So YouTube and creators, what makes uh, an effective creator and how can you really use that platform to activate others? I think it's the ability to talk and have conversations even with people you disagree with. Because unfortunately we live in a world today where having conversations, I mean it's not as easy as it was some years ago. And I think when you can like, hold a conversation with someone you really disagree with, you may, be, like, you may change that person's opinion mm. because you are now both having a conversation, exchanging information, and you are both respecting each other. So for me, good activism and what makes a good activist would be like, I think it, it has really to do with your ability and your capacity to just respect other people regardless of their opinion so you can at least start to have a conversation. You may not change someone's opinion overnight, but at least you can put enough doubts in their head so that they over time can like, uh, get a new, better opinion. Yeah. <laughs> well, and our opinion can change as well, so yeah, it's very much that conversation. Okay, uh, like we're that. almost done. Last question. So as we think about Climate Week and beyond, I love that, that uh, focus on what comes after. What's your call to action for this group and, and for those that are listening to us, and listening to us online? Um, what can we do uh, to accelerate that transition to a just energy um, future and towards more environmental? Justice. Kate, maybe if we can start with you. Yeah, I, I'm a really big believer in the flywheel that's actually represented on this stage. You know, there's a huge role that companies need to play, and this is what I've been working on for almost a decade, is really enabling companies to take action, to set bold goals and work towards them. Then we need our policymakers to set those policies, to create those enabling environments for us to move more quickly together. And then we need creatives and we need everyday people in our lives, like you know, moms like me who I'm trying to show my daughter, what does it look like to get to school more sustainably? What does a more sustainable diet mean? You know, how do we think about what we buy and what we consume? So for me, I think it's that flywheel that's so powerful and so self-reinforcing and we need to get it moving more quickly, but this stage is a great example of what's possible. Yeah. Here, here. Pedro, what about, <clears throat> what do you think? I think that if I just would get the takeaway, it would be that don't fall for the trap that tries to make you believe that time is over and we have mm -hmm. no more actions possible. There is a time window, we are inside it right now. So we need good solutions, we need good discussions like this so we can go forward. But this time window is getting shorter mm -hmm. every day and we need to do what we have to do and what we can do as soon as possible. But the future is optimistic if we do something. You know, so we do something now. Mm. Michael. 
Sure, absolutely. The one thing I would think about is I'm, I'm proud that this movement leads with environmental justice, leads with equity. Um, that doesn't just happen. Uh, you can't just talk about it. You have to be about it. It's about changing policy. EPA worked with us to push us to make sure we have the highest living allowance for AmeriCorps VISTA members that we've ever had. Otherwise, service is a luxury for a few instead of an opportunity for the many because you actually have to afford to eat and have a roof <laughs> over your head when you serve. Uh, we have, you get funds for to go to college. You pay off student loans. We're providing world-class job training. And so when you think about equity and, and justice, think about not just talking about it, uh, but changing policies and procedures that allows that to happen. And otherwise, I would say, if you are in the private sector, think about working with us to provide career pathways and training uh, for our American Climate Corps and our EJCC. Um, are we saying EJCC? Is it, we, did we make that? <laughs> our EJCC. We we're did. from Washington. We love a good acronym. Our, our EJCC. So that's a way that you can partner. If you're from a philanthropy or have money at all, we'll take it uh, because we need to raise living allowances. We need to provide housing and training. And then anybody can help us recruit or anyone can join. And we talk a lot about young people and young people are leading this movement, but you can be 75 and still join us as well. You could be 80. I see some 90 year olds. Um, and so just go to acc.gov. There are opportunities online today. Uh, you do not have to wait. So you can join us. We can put you to work. You can change your community and change our country, or you can help us spread the word. Yes, awesome. Great. And Administrator Reagan, what's your call to action? I think I'm going to take a page out of Pedro's book and, and piggyback on this uh, elevating optimism mm -hmm. and understanding that you know, our best days are ahead of us. And what I would say is, to take a look at this stage, not as individuals, but what we represent. And the reality is, and is that public-private partnerships exist to find solutions to these challenging issues. And I would encourage everyone in the room here to focus on those connections and create some downward pressure on elected officials and politicians. Unfortunately, the political discourse in this country focuses on the least common denominator and not the aspirational goals that many of us are aspiring to. And so instead of looking to some of our political leaders and political discourse, I think we should keep dreaming and connecting as individuals and striving for these solutions that we all deserve and then forcing our politicians to be accountable and execute on the will of the people. So I think that we have to do that for our young people. Uh, and I think we have to continue to strive to be the best that we can be. And the, the way to do that is to stay connected as humans and get outside of some of these systems that are suppressing us. All right. Absolutely. Thank you for everything that you do. Congratulations on the really exciting announcement and milestone today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.